Sorry, boy. But his captain's got to teach his men what happens to those while crossing. Captain's got to teach stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning from the Bat Cave. It is uh, it's Monday, January 22, uh, 2024. I just witnessed the Lions win their first, I think, playoff game since I was in high school. So that was that would have been the ninety or not. It might have might have even been junior high, but it, this was this was like, I think, the early nineties. So um, if the Lions win the Super Bowl, um, I'm I'm calling it the world's gonna end. Um, also, the world's gonna end. So either way, it's gonna happen. But um, I uh, I'm, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take you guys through Job. Um, I'm going to try to knock this out in maybe four sessions. It's, it's a lot of text. It's not an overly complicated narrative, um, but it's a lot of text and there's a lot of little gold nuggets in it. Um, so what I want to do is kind of walk you guys through it between Genesis and Exodus, because what it does is if you know when it was written, again, the, the story probably comes into the scripture um, Again, this is theory, but it probably came into the scripture through Solomon. Remember, um, David would have subdued the Edomites. Job apparently marries into the Edomites. Um, he would have been a Hebrew from the table of nations, but he ultimately ends up married into the um, Edomite line and becoming one of the early kings of Edom. And so um, David would have sub subdued Edom. Solomon would have married into Edomite lines. Remember, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Um, he would have done that for political reasons, and he would have been deeply married into the Edomites. So this story could have been an oral tradition, or it could have been a written you know, story. We know papyrus they've had for quite some time. Um, but, you know, Job lived to be, as, as an Edomite king, he probably was king somewhere in the ballpark of 50 to 100 years. So um, this would have been during the time that the Jews were in Egypt. And remember, for their first 100 years in Egypt, they're back and forth. Um, they're not necessarily stuck in Goshen. They don't get put to slavery for about, you know, the second 100 years. <clears throat> and then they really start to get oppressed. And uh, it's it's the generation where they get oppressed into slavery and then their baby's murdered, which is where Moses is going to take them out. And Moses takes them out about 80 years later. So you kind of have like 100 good years where much of that they're under Joseph. Um, and then you have a, a year, <clears throat> uh, a generation where they uh, the, you have a Pharaoh rise that doesn't know Joseph. He starts to treat the Israelites bad. Um, and then you have basically the last generation that, you know, Moses is, you know, going from infancy to age 80 when he brings them out. So it's going to be a total of about 210 years. Job in probably the first half of that is going to be his reign as king. He would have passed away, um, by the time they come out. But, um, you, you actually have these conjectures because of the timing of it all. And I don't think they're true. I think they're just made up stories. But like in the Talmud about how Job was part of a council of men who, uh, along with Moses's, um, uh, Moses's uh, father-in-law Jethro and uh, Balaam um, that uh, took counsel together with Pharaoh when he decided to kill all the babies. And then the Talmud would say that Job was being persecuted because of not speaking up in that council. Essentially, he like one person, um, basically Balaam said, do it. Um, Jethro, I forget what he said. I think he said, I don't know, or maybe no. And that's why he's considered righteous. And then like Job didn't speak up and that's why uh, he got persecuted. Um, I don't think that's true. I think that the, if you read the Talmud, they made up a lot of stuff. Um, Balaam was much younger than than Job, so I think they're just putting these three men in the in 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 a council because they're all known in the region, and I just think it's BS. I think the 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 Talmudic rabbis made stuff up a lot. I've heard some wacky stories from them, like how all the Jews had septub septub uh, sex tuplets in um, in. Um, Egypt and then how the killing of the babies happened six times. This is just this is just made up stuff. And of course, rabbis, just like Christian teachers, make up stuff to try to, you know, draw a special audience to themselves about their deep, deep knowledge, but it's all made up. Okay. And they'll say it's in the typology and in between the letters and all this weird stuff and it's just not. So 
remember, just because it comes from a Jew doesn't mean it's it's more uh, intelligent or like they have, you know, extra biblical divine revelation that we don't. Their prophets did, their their scriptural authors did, just like our apostles did. Um, they're not more refined than us in the ability to discern things. And if they were, they wouldn't have missed their Messiah. Okay. So, um, starting with the Book of Job, you have it says that there's a there's a man in the land of Uz now. You're going to have two oozes mentioned in scripture, okay? And I'm going to I'm going to guess that Job is going to be probably in the Aramean region. And so the Aramean region is going to be think like southwest uh, Syria, so the uh, the area between Damascus and the Golan Heights, which would have been the area um, north of you're going to have Let me let me show you a map here. So this is going to be a pretty pretty decent map of of Jerusalem, um, the, but this is going to be more in the t in the days of the divided kingdom. So you're going to have northern Israel. No, I'm sorry. This looks like it's actually more in the time of Jesus. Okay. So um, in ancient times, you're going to have the kingdom of Ammon, the kingdom of Moab, the kingdom of Edom down here. Um, they're going to be in the Negev, and you see Basra right here. Basra is where Job was king. Okay. Um, if you go up here, you see the kingdom of Damascus, okay? Damascus is, is going to be the Aramean kingdom. So this is a major city of theirs, but essentially Syria is Aramean. Iraq is Chaldean. Um, and then uh, the northwest part, part of Syria and Iraq is going to be Assyrian, okay? And um, when you get into your table of nations, you're going to actually have um, in Genesis, I think, 11... Oh, Genesis 10, when you talk about the Arameans, you have uh, the children of Aram, Uz, Hall, Gether, and Mash. So there's where you get an Uz from. Now, there is another Uz in the line of Edom, but for the amount of time it is, he's like a, I think he's like a grandchild or a great, great, great grandchild of Edom. And I don't think there would have been time for him to have his own region that's named after him. That Job would be said he's from Uz, okay? Um, I think, again, remember Eliphaz the Temanite is one of his friends, so he could have migrated and moved and, you know, married into the Edomite, Edomite line from there. Um, so let's see, we've got Genesis 36, we have the children of Dishon, our Uz. So um, let's see who this Dishon is. So um, Dishon is the son of Anna. He's going to be the sister of Oholibama, who, who marries Esau. So maybe he could have his own, own land in Esau. If he's got a son named Uz... And a holy Bama marries Esau, well, then he's roughly contemporary with Esau or Eliphaz the Temanite. So Uz could potentially have his own land, okay? So it could be this Uz. It, there could be an Uz in the land of Seir, you know, and again, it would have been a smaller region, like what we would consider more like a state or a province of Edom. Uh, or it could have been this other ooze, and it could be a state or a pro province of Aramea. E either way, you're 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 within like I think like a couple hundred miles of, of where it is, um, and all these guys could have traveled to that region. Now the reason I I, I lean towards thinking it's um, in the land of ooze in Aramea is because the children of um, Aram he has ooze Gesher and Math. And uh, one of them has a, uh, let me see if I can find booze. You actually have Air Abraham, when when Abraham goes to um, send his uh, servant to get a, a wife for Isaac, um, it talks about uh, Milcah, um, which is, I think his brother's wife has, has had kids, and his kids' names are Hoos and Booze, okay? So Hoos can sometimes be pronounced Ooz, but remember, this is in the same area of Aram. And um, one of the guys who comes to um, Abraham is a Shuaite, which is going to be a descendant of Abraham through Keturah. Um, the guy, Elihu, who speaks up at the end, is a Buzite. And so you see kind of the, you know, the contemporary. Again, this is going to be somebody roughly contemporary, probably um, somewhere between Abraham and Isaac's age, named Buz. So... If you're looking at, you know, with, let, let's say within 100 years or so of this, there, there you would have had Buzite people. So you have Buzites around Aram where Uz is, and it seems like that's where Job is, and then his other friends have traveled to meet him. So that's why I would expect 
um, it, it to be in the Aramean region. So um, it's not a super important thing. There's no doctrine that hangs on this, but this is just kind of giving you guys a frame of reference for the time and the other peoples involved. Um, all of these people, with the exception of one, is kind of disputed in who he is, but um, we'll, we'll get into the, the people involved in a minute. So... Um, So again, the story of Job, I'm assuming that the story of Job takes place before the Tower of Babel incident. You you have mention of the Chaldeans raiding him, and you also have mention of um, the Sabaeans raiding him. And Job would have had uh, bro a brother named Seba, um, where one group of Sabaeans comes from. Um, and then uh, Cush would have had a son named Sheba, and I think another uh, grandson named Seba. So you would have had a Sabaeans who come from Cush. Well, Nimrod comes from Cush. So when you see Job getting raided by Chaldeans and by Sabaeans, which are both associated with, um, with Cush and Nimrod's rule, it looks like they're still in the period where Nimrod has a strong kingdom. And he's, remember, he, he would um, send out people as far away as Aramea and Seir and Canaan um, to basically exact tribute. And this is probably in the decline of his kingdom where people are still going out to raid stuff um, um, but it's probably in the period where they're starting to build the Tower of Babel but the Tower of Babel incident hasn't happened yet which is why you're seeing Edomites and uh, Buzites would have been which would have been Arameans and um, you're seeing Job which would have um, had his own language group because he would have been one of the 70 tables of nations and you're seeing them all communicate with each other okay And so this is why I imagine this to be pretty early on in the period, somewhere around um, uh, Joseph being sent into Egypt, okay? So we'll just get into this. Uh, the, the major themes of, of Job are going to be really um, really two, two things that are going to come through. And what it is is, is it's, it's, this is a very old book, and I want you guys to understand this because this is how an ancient Edomite would have understood God's sovereignty. They would have understood how God and Satan interact. They would have understood how God judges man. And this is really, this whole book is meant to correct man's way of thinking because man is going to generally exist on the assumption that if you do good, good things will happen to you. If you do bad, bad things will happen to you. And um, generally speaking, that is true, but we're going to learn about um, people who are specially chosen to suffer more than others, and you're, they're going to come into the lines of people like Moses and David and stuff like that, and the reason is, is because God is leading them to suffer to really learn what it feels like to be God. Um, that's where the sufferings come from. And so they're suffering because of their righteousness, not because of their wickedness. Now, Moses and David made big mistakes, yes, but Joseph did not. Daniel did not. Uh, Job did not. And so that's where you're going to hear, like in Ezekiel, he's going to talk about, remember, Noah Noah is known as a righteous man. And that's why in Ezekiel, when uh, Israel is about to be destroyed, he's going to say, if Noah, Job, and Daniel were all there, um, I would not spare the city because it's so wicked, okay? So Noah, Job, and Daniel are people who are known to never really have done anything wrong in their lives, okay? Everybody has sin. Nobody is, nobody is accounting themselves sin, sinless, and Job is even going to account the sins of his youth. So don't think when it says righteous, righteous means sinless, okay? It means you have a right um, in, in, heart full of integrity towards God. If It means when you make a mistake, you own it, and you ask for forgiveness, and you try to make amends, okay? Um, same thing with Moses and Daniel and Joseph. I'm sure they all made human mistakes and, and you know, had human errors of heart and, and sinned. So don't think... When the Bible calls them righteous, it means sinless. The Bible doesn't never, never requires sinlessness to be righteous, okay, or to be accounted righteous with God. It requires faith in God, trust in God, okay? And you can trust in God and do things that are sinful because you go through moments of weakness in that trust in God and you do those sinful things doesn't necessarily mean that's the permanent direction of your heart or the general um, habit of your behavior, okay? So um, the point of Job is, and it's, it, it very much coincides with, with the timing of Joseph, is that 
you know, sometimes you can suffer and you're not doing anything wrong necessarily. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean always if you suffer, it's persecution from Satan. And there are people that are going to take this the wrong way. There are people who are going to um, be stubborn. They're not acting in wisdom. Maybe they're walking in sin. And then they're going to look at the consequences of that as persecution from Satan. You're going to have others who are going to judge people the way Job's friends judge them. This is actually pretty common among um, Word of Faith, uh, Charismatics, and Pentecostals. Okay. So I actually went to a church who, if you guys remember the song that was pretty popular in the early 2000s um, that said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's based on the story of Job. And Blessed be the name of the Lord is going to have a line in it where it says, He gives and takes away, He gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that's directly from the book of Job. Well, the church I was going to for eight years, which was influenced by Raymond Bible College and Word of Faith teaching, they would they would not sing that line when they played the song in worship. They did not like that line, even though it's straight out of the book of Job, and even though it, it, Job is accounted as righteous after saying it, they wouldn't say that because um, the word of faith teaching has a really simple paradigm, which is good God, bad devil. If anything bad happens, it's the devil. God doesn't have a hand in it. And rather than saying, hey, God allows the devil to tempt us, to test us, and to even cause us suffering. Um, and he's going to have purposes in that. He's not just doing it. You know, God is not just doing it because he doesn't care, nor is he necessarily mad at us for any specific thing he's doing. But he does do that. And um, it's a major part of the Christian life to undergo suffering and share in the sufferings of Christ. And that means the sufferings of Christ that they talk about is being persecuted for for righteousness, not for as a not dealing with the consequences for your sin or your lack of wisdom. Okay, and so <clears throat> you know the Romans Romans eight is going to say that we're God's children if or we we we're, we're basically um, we're we're destined to reign with Christ if we suffer with Him, and so. It is a part. It is a part of the normal Christian life, and remember, we don't have an old covenant yet. This isn't a time where you have the Abrahamic promises and the Abrahamic covenant with God, but we don't have a Mosaic covenant yet. So we don't have an old covenant. Nobody's under the law. Nobody's necessarily keeping Sabbath. Now there might people be people who keep Sabbath as a memorial, but we have no record of that in Scripture. Okay, so you guys want to when you interface with your Hebrew roots people, you want to show them, hey, we have Job. And we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we have no reference of Sabbath keeping. We have no real reference of tithing except for the one time Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils of one war to Melchizedek. We have no records of kosher keeping. We have no records of most of what was um, <clears throat> mandated in the law. We do have something like the Leverite law of like raising up seed for your brother still in play. Um, and we do have sacrifices going on. But again, we have this sense able. It doesn't necessarily mean there's a mosaic prescription that they're doing it a specific way like God commanded Moses, okay? Because God hasn't gotten to the point where he's revealing, you know, again, he's, he's, he, these things are going to symbolize um, really Christ. And so he, God hasn't gotten to the point where he's revealed that yet, but he has revealed a lot. And so as you read Job, you want to think about those major themes, but you also want to, because of that, you want to carefully read what every party is saying, because the um, the people, Job's friends who judge him are going to say a lot of true and commonly held things. And a lot of those things they say are going to show up in the Psalms and the Proverbs. And they're also going to show up in later prophecies and stuff like this. So we know that these things were probably common sayings uh, in the Middle East in, in from the days of Abraham, you know, because Job is pretty old. Job is probably younger than Abraham, um, but he is his, um, he's from the, the ancestry. He's the youngest kid of the youngest kid in the table of nations. So he's from the um, genetic lines that are still living like 250 years old. Okay. And so he is his relatives and, you know, his uncles and stuff like that are going to be the people who still live to be 400 years old. And you're, he's basically like three generations removed from the people that got off the ark. Okay? So um, the, the, you're going to hear these people mentioned in Deuteronomy. They're going to be called the ancient ones or the old ones. 
um, that were basically the last of them w would have been uh, dying off around the time they came out of Egypt. So rem remember, if Job's story starts around the time they go into Egypt, he is um, probably going to die um, towards the end of their captivity in Egypt or in the latter half of their captivity in Egypt. And, um, and then you're still going to have people that are descended from him that are going to live, you know, the durations of like, you remember, you get down to Abraham and Isaac are still living to be 180 years old. And then it drops with Jacob down to 140 years old. So you want to assume the other um, generations from the other uh, nations and tribes and things like that have a similar kind of decomposition in age. And so you're going to have people that, you know, are still probably around that are living Close, up, upwards of 150 to 200 years old. And by the time their 40 years in the wilderness wanderings are over, it seems like most of those people have died off. Um, and then most people en end up living again like they do in normal ages, which is like you might live up to 120 if you're extremely blessed and healthy and have really good circumstances, but most people are going to live to be 70 to 80. Um, and you're going to still p see people in the ages of, you know, the classical Greek era and stuff like that that are living to be 90 and stuff like that. So don't don't fall for this idea that everybody only lived to be like 40 back then. That's not true. You did have eras in history where people, you know, it was common for people to live to be 40 to 60. But that's usually because of disease and pioneering and lack of civilization and just really rough living. Okay. Don't think that it's like it was normal for people's ages to drop to like 40 years of age. Your secular historians are going to try to tell you that because they're trying to make kind of like evolutionary theory and stuff like that work. And um, they're going to have a lot of biases in how they how they um, imagine these things. But the records of the people that we have um, from ancient times, we still have people with the exception of people who are getting killed living to be 80, 90 years old. It seems to be pretty common. So we get into Job's story. He's in the land of Uz, and he says there's a man named Job who was perfect and upright. Now, remember, perfect doesn't mean sinless. What perfect means is that um, he's mature. <clears throat> so this word Tom, it says complete, pious, specifically gentle, dear, perfect, plain, undefiled, upright. Okay, And it basically means he has integrity. It means he is not walking in any sin. He is not living with unrepentance. He's not living with um, unforgiveness or anything like that would defile him um, before God. In other words, there's there's nothing in his heart that um, that the Holy Spirit would be convicting him of. Okay, and he says, um, and there was born unto him. Uh, he it says he feared God and eschewed evil. This is this is the kind of guy who won't watch a rated R movie with you. Okay. He is probably more righteous than you or I watching this. He probably wouldn't watch most of what you'd watch on TV. Uh, he wouldn't swear. He's one of those people that you know who never swear. And, you know, I would like to be this righteous one day. I'm just not. I'm just not. I've had my ups and downs. I, I'm doing better than I was in the past. But there are other times where I was doing better than I think I probably am now. I think we live in a world that is surrounded with you know, um, swearing, cursing, anger, um, bad attitudes, lust, pornography, just everywhere we are. And it's kind of hard to keep yourself pure. You, you almost have to separate yourself. But this guy separated himself, okay? And he was, he feared God and he eschewed evil. Eschewed kind of means like he, um, he fled from it. It says to turn off, to bring, to call back, decline, depart, get away, lay away, leave undone pluck away, remove. So it's like he, he, he keeps away from, he just avoids the wicked. Okay. But he's doing pretty well for himself. He's like an Abraham. He's got huge flocks and herds. He's wealthy. He's got 10 kids. Um, he would be very much like an Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. And it says his substance was 7,000 sheep and seven, uh, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, a very great household. And that this man was the greatest of all the men in the East. Don't try to find anything in the numbers here. There's nothing in the numbers here, okay? This is just the count of his substance, okay? Um, people will try to do stuff like that. Remember, this is not an allegory. This is a true story. Now, the way it's written might have been written so it could be performed in like a play or something like that so people can keep remembering it, and that might be why it seems to have these long discourses and it just seems to be like, almost like a stage performance, these long, eloquent discourses. 
but the story is meant to be a true story of what happened, okay? And um, again, a lot of this stuff is going to be in the Psalms and Proverbs, so you're probably looking at this as the root of those things. And this story was probably well known among the Edomites, um, and it probably is going to come into the Hebrew tradition somewhere around the days of David and Solomon in their interactions with the Edomites, and then they um, pick Solomon probably picks it up in, in into the wisdom literature. Because Solomon's going to get stuff from other kings outside of that, and he is married in with a lot of other kings, okay? So it says, um, let's see, his, his sons went and feasted in his houses. So he has seven sons and three daughters, and they feast in their houses, everyone in this day. Now this is going to be important, folks. His sons went and feasted in their houses, everyone his day. So he's got seven sons, and they're gathering to feast in their houses, okay? Guess what that means? It means nobody's keeping Sabbath, okay? They are gathering and they're going to each other's houses once a week. And remember, there's nothing about his children that we see that are wicked, okay? We have no real evidence that they're wicked. Um, but there's seven of them, which means every day of the week they're gathering and going to each other's houses to feast, okay? They're all loaded. They're rich kids, okay? But they're all adults and they're going over to, they're calling their sisters over and they're taking turns being the hosts, the seven sons are, of the family. And they're just getting together with each other. They just, they live well and they just get together and eat and they love each other, okay? So don't think of anything amiss about them just because um, Job's offering sacrifices to them. They probably are spoiled, but there's no record of them being evil. Again, they seem to get along with each other great, Okay. And it was so that in the date when the days of their feasting had gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt, burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job says, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed gods in their heart. And thus Job did continually. Okay. Now, don't think of Job offering sacrifices for his sons as an implication that they're wicked. A lot of people, remember, you're going to have, especially in the Word of Faith charismatic camp, you're going to have people trying to prove that either Job or his kids were wicked and they deserved what they got. Okay. This is what going to, this is going to be what God rebukes his, um, friends for at the end of Job. So don't think that, okay? Job, this is Job going, he knows he has a bunch of kids who are probably getting together, eating and drinking. They're rich. They're probably spoiled. And he knows it. And he knows human nature. And so he is routinely offering sacrifices for them just in case, okay? He's a at pleading for God for mercy for them just in case and they're eating and drinking they're they're not acknowledging God or they're cursing God in their hearts okay so think this is not meant to say anything about Job's kids it's meant to say something about Job and how righteous he is so he's so righteous that like just in case he is offering up sacrifices and remember when you offer up sacrifices this is a cost to you okay when you're regularly offering up sacrifices if they're meeting every day, that means he's doing this on a regular basis. He is continually offering up sacrifices, which means he's he's taking of his wealth and offering it up to God to plea continually for mercy on his kids. Okay? It's, it's meant to highlight how righteous he is. And it says, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Okay? So again, this is sons of God. It's representing Elohim. Um, it's going to say, Bene I Elohim. Um, Satan is among them. These sons of God are angels. Okay? The watcher angels. These are going to be the people who basically um, are uh, watching over the, the uh, humanity. Okay? They're not necessarily the 70 nations yet. Um, but you're going to have these various angels who are assigned to watch over man and report to God what's going on, okay? And Satan's among them, okay? And um, remember, God has prophesied a coming righteous one uh, who's going to be of uh, this seed of man who is going to deliver them from the serpent, okay? And... It seems like the the beginning of this conversation could be God kind of messing with Satan to say, um, could that be the one? Remember, he he hasn't prophesied or really narrowed this down. Um, you do have the prophecy of J, uh, Joseph, which is probably going to be around this time where it narrows it down to the line of Judah. 
um, you have you basically just have it uh, you have it um, really narrowed down to the line of Shem um, and then Abraham is you know in his old age it seems like it's going to be through Isaac um, it just says that all the nations are going to be blessed through him it doesn't really say the Messiah is going to come through him okay so um, you, you have dwelling in the tents of Shem and that might be the closest thing and Job would have been in the lines of Shem okay and so it seems like any potential Messiah, Satan's out to corrupt them, okay? And so um, God's allowing him to do this because, remember, the one that he can't corrupt is also ultimately going to be Jesus, and Jesus is actually going to suffer wor worse than Job. He's not going to have a bunch of boils, but he's going to be nailed to a cross, and, you know, his back's going to be shredded and all this stuff, okay? So... You, you have Satan doing with Jesus what he's doing with Job. He's trying to get him to turn on God. And Job, he's going to test really to the limit. And God is going to show up before Job can really fall over and curse God. He's not going to curse God in this. But he is going to get close to the point of blasphemy. And that's when Elihu kind of shows up and basically gives him a mouthful in the Holy Spirit. And that's when God shows up. Okay? So... It does look like he's pushing him to the limits of what he can handle, and if he kept going, perhaps, perhaps he might have cursed God. Um, but he doesn't, and God is merciful, and he, he basically puts a stop to his suffering at the point where, okay, Job's getting close to accusing God of wrongdoing. Um, we're close to blasphemy now, and... Um, that's when we're going to um, shut this down, okay? But he shuts it down in mercy. Job humbles himself in God's presence because remember, the original the original bet between Satan and God is that he can get Job to curse God to his face. So the angel of the Lord is going to show up, and he doesn't curse him. He is humble. He's silent. He shuts his mouth. He's like, I'm nobody. Whatever you say is right, okay? So Satan loses the bet, but he does get Job to a point of, you know, basically accusing God of things he's not doing, okay? Because he just doesn't know. He's going through a lot of crap. So you, you don't want to be part of the people who are judging Job in this story. So anyways, it says, a day comes and they're going to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came, comes among them, and then the Lord says to him, from where do you come? And Satan says, um, from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down in it, okay? So a lot of people are going to use this to assume that Satan's been cast out of heaven, and that is not true, okay? Remember, Satan was walking in the garden. He was not cast out, but so was the Lord. The Lord was certainly not cast out. So the fact that he's walking in the earth does not mean he's cast out. Angels can go back and forth between earth. They can walk. They can manifest. There is nothing to suggest that Satan has lost his wings or that he had wings to begin with. Not all angels have wings. Um, there's nothing to suggest that he's lost his ability to go back and forth between heaven and earth because he's obviously doing that. And he's certainly not cast out of heaven because he's obviously in heaven. Okay. When you get to Ezekiel, um, I think it's Ezekiel 28, um, which is going to be around the time of the destruction of the temple. So this is going to be around five to 600 BC. Say the Lord is, is very clear that he's going to cast out Satan out of heaven in the future. Okay. So in 500 BC, he hasn't been cast out yet. When, when Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning, he's prophesying what's which is going to happen in revelation 12. So don't assume this Satan being cast out back in history and there being a pre-Adamic race. Remember, all those theories would come from mistakes in Roman Catholicism and in Protestantism and especially related to uh, the pre-Adamic race, which is going to come out of the gap theory, which is going to be a response to uh, early evolutionary thinking. So don't, don't subscribe to any of that. You want to understand that Satan, like many angels, goes back and forth between earth and heaven. Okay? Just like Christ does. Okay? So, it says, The Lord says to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, perf a perfect and up upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil? Okay? Now, I would assume that if he's ever sinned before in his youth, Satan would know it. But... I don't really know specifically why God's pointing him out. So it, it's, he's obviously not a perfect sinless person, um, but he seems to be more righteous than others. And I don't know if God is um, 
just pointing him out to brag on him um, because Satan is constantly accusing man. Remember, God doesn't look at man as like, yeah, man's going to err in foolishness, but not every man. God does never describes all men as deliberately evil or as bent towards evil, okay? By the time you get to the New Testament, he, Paul is going to pull together a bunch of scriptures about how all sin, okay? And we know that every man's heart is set on evil continually from his youth, which means because of the corruption in the world, you're going to have people become more and more sinful over time. But God is making it clear that there are still people in the earth who um, lean towards God and lean towards righteousness, and Job seems to be one of the top ones. Now, I, we, it doesn't get into why. Like, again, I, I could speculate that maybe he's suggesting to Satan that this is where the Messiah could come from, or maybe he's just pointing out Job for Job's sake. It doesn't really say why, but um, Job is going to be one of the 70 nations, and um, you know, maybe maybe he's just trying Satan to just say, you know, see, they're not they're not as wicked as you think, because Satan's always trying to get them destroyed. Okay. So uh, Satan answered and says, "Does God uh, does Job fear God for nothing?" Uh, he said, "He's made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has in every size. He's blessed the work of his hands and his substance is, is increased in the land. But put, put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he'll surely curse you to your face." So it's not just blaspheme; it's not just say something wrong about God. It's cursing him to his face. Okay, this is what Satan is, is saying that he can get him to do. Okay, and the Lord says to Satan, "Behold, all that he has in your power only uh, upon him himself. Like putting out forth your hand." So Satan goes forth, and he's going to get his kids killed. Um, and then it says, uh, another messenger is going to come and say, the Sabaeans fell on them and took their oxen away. So the Sabaeans, remember, you're going to have uh, Sabaeans that come from um, Cush. So Cush is going to have Seba. And remember, Cush is going to beget Nimrod, and Nimrod is going to rule over the Chaldeans, which are going to come from our Faxad, which are going to be a Semitic people. So um, it's probably people who are sent out by Nimrod. But these are these guys, uh, when you see Havila, these guys are probably going to be nomadic people that live uh, in the south of Saudi Arabia. So they probably are going to travel around the Arabian desert. Maybe they're going back and forth between Nimrod's kingdom, but they swing by and steal all his oxen, okay? Okay. Um, so that's going to be um, the Sabaeans, I believe. Um, there could be other Sabaeans later on, but um, based on the timing, it seems like it's those Sabaeans. And then, let's see. <clears throat> While he's yet speaking, fire falls from heaven, burns up all his sheep. Uh, and then the Chaldeans, it says, made out three bands. So again, these are other Semites, but they're ruled by Nimrod. Under, under our facts ad and this is going to be um he's going to be the father of Selah, the father of eber so they would be distantly related to um to uh job um but they're really under the power of nimrod so you're probably going to have chaldeans coming and the chaldeans are also they're going to get, they're going to get through through this guy canaan they're going to get into astrology and stuff like that. So they they are becoming wicked, okay? Um, <clears throat> so he says the Chaldeans are going to uh, basically kill all his servants and take all his camels. So they take his camels, take his oxen, the sheep are burned up, and his kids are dead, okay? And then it says a great wind come, came from the wilderness and fell on the four corners of the house that his kids are in, and his kids are all dead. He's only escaped to help them. And Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell down on the ground, and worshipped, saying, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So Job is going to be around 110 years old when this happens. Like Abraham, he's going to have a wife who's probably old and past childbearing age. Um... And uh, his other kids are not going to come from her. Her other kids are going to come from a granddaughter uh, or great-granddaughter of Esau. Okay? But all his kids are dead and everything he has is taken away. He probably still has money. Maybe not a lot. Um, but most of his money is invested in these flocks and these herds. And he's probably got a business similar to Abraham's 
where you're selling sheep, you're selling you know, wool, you're selling, um, you know, your oxes are probably hired out to plow people's fields. Your camels are probably hired out for journeys or stuff, and you're probably buying and selling camels. So think of it like a car dealer and a tractor dealer and um, <clears throat> and uh, raw materials dealer for clothes and then, and then milk and stuff like that too. So food dealer, okay? So he's, his, his wealth is well invested. He doesn't have a lot of money left. He's pretty much broke, okay? He's got a house, but he's pretty much lost everything but his wife, okay? And uh, Satan's going to come back before the Lord, and he's going to be like, so how'd that go, Satan? And uh, he's going to be like, isn't there none like him on earth, perfect and upright, that fears God and eschews evil and holds fast to integrity, even when you moved me to destroy him without cause? Okay, remember, this is God talking, without cause. You cannot, you absolutely cannot try to make a justification for why uh, Satan is um, destroying Job or his kids, okay? It's very clearly without cause per God. And God's not dumb, okay? So Satan says skin for skin. He's in other words, yeah, he still has his life. He can still rebuild. Um, so that's the only reason why. Maybe, or maybe he's scared and he's just thankful that he still has his life. Point is, is he's saying he does not really honor you, God. And the uh, Lord says, Satan, okay, well, his, he's in your hand, but don't actually kill him, okay? So Satan goes from his presence Smotes Job with boils from his foot to his crown. So these things itch. These things have pus. These things are ugly. And he's taking a pot shirt to scrape himself and sitting down in the ashes. And his wife says to him, do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. She's basically saying, God obviously hates you. So why don't you just curse him and die? Now, we don't see what happens to this wife after this. But my guess is that he divorces her. That would be my guess. Um, cause she's got some pretty bad advice for a wife, but he said, now remember she doesn't have boils or anything. She's lost all her kids. She's probably obviously embittered at that, but she's saying, why don't you just curse God and die? Okay. Um, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. What shall we receive in the hand of God? What shall we not receive evil and all this God Job did not send with his lips. And Job's like, you know what I think I want to do? I think I want to get a, a young wife a second wife and you can go be number one wife and you can be in charge of all the servants if we ever get any back but i'm gonna get me a young and um and job uh goes to his three friends and heard of all the evil that was upon him and uh they came everyone from his own place so here's the people who are going to come to comfort job and they're going to suck at it okay so you're going to have eliphaz the temanite this is going to be eliphaz esau's oldest son Teman is going to be his grandson, and so his grandson is going to be the tribal head, and so the Temanite Duke Teman is going to be one of them. Eliphaz is not a duke. Teman is a duke. So let's go to um, Genesis 36, where it talks about all this. It says uh, his sons are, uh, oh, the sons of Eliphaz are Teman. So I'm sorry, Teman is his son, which means he's going to be the tribal head. And then when you look for, uh, here's the Dukes of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, Duke Teman, okay? So e e Eliphaz is not going to be a Duke, or just just like um, Noah's sons are not going to be the head of a nation. It's going to be the third generation. Just like the third generation from um, Abraham becomes the nation, um, and then obviously you're going to have the 70 sons of Israel become the elders, and so they're going to be the heads of the um, clans of Israel, and then the tribes of Israel are going to be the 12 sons, okay? So Teman is going to be a, a duke El, the, uh, of Eliphaz, and that's why it's going to say, and that's why he's going to be called a Temanite, because he is going to dwell in the house of his firstborn son. <clears throat> The next one is going to be Bildad the Shuhite, and the Shuhite is going to be the descendants of Shua. So if you were to go to Genesis 27, if you were to go to Genesis 25, you're going to have Abraham takes a second wife after Sarah dies. It's actually his third wife because this male was counted as his wife, but he's divorced her. He's put her away. Um, you're going to have Zimram, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak and Shua. 
So the Shuai, Bildad the Shuai, is going to be descended from him. And so uh, this is going to happen after Sarah's dead. Um, Abraham is going to be upstairs of 100. Um, she's going to, or, I'm sorry, Abraham's going to be probably about 140, I think, because Isaac is 40 years old um, when Sarah dies. So he's going to be somewhere around, you know, Sarah was, was 90 when she had him. She's going to be 130 when she dies. He's going to be around 140 when she dies. And sometime after that, he takes a wife. So Abraham still has, you know, another um, 40, 40 plus years left. Okay. And so in that time, he's going to have another wife and he's going to have five more sons. I'm just Zimran, Jokshan, Midian, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Six more kids, okay, with this other younger woman, okay? And Shua is going to, by the time you get to the days of Esau and Elamites, Shua is probably going to be an older man who is going to be somewhere around the age of Isaac, okay? Um, Isaac lived to be 180, which means the Shua clan is probably going to be a pretty good sized and you're probably going to have hundreds of them, just like you have a lot of descendants of Isaac and Jacob. Okay. And then the third one is going to be Zophar the Namathite. And I don't know who the Namathites are. If you go to Namathite, I don't think, like you have a Nama mentioned, which is uh, Noah's wife, but you don't have any mention in the Bible of Namathites other than this. So I don't have a theory on who the Namathites are. But the Buzites seem to come from uh, Abraham's descendants too, or Abraham's brother's descendants. Eliphaz seems to come from Esau's descendants, and Shua seems to come from Abraham's descendants. So you see how all these people are pretty closely related, and Job is their friend, but Job is going to be a Hebrew as well. Job is going to be descended from um, Joktan, which is going to be the other branch of the Hebrews between Peleg and Joktan. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come from Peleg, and then the Western Arabian peoples are going to come from Joktan. So most of his relatives are going to be from Mount Sephar, which is going to be in Yemen, straight up the Red Sea coast, up to where uh, Job is ultimately going to end up, which is going to be in Edom. Okay, He might, again, he could be in, in, in Seir right now, or he could be in the area of Aramea. It's somewhere in that region, but they're not terribly far apart. It's just literally straight up the um, Jordan River coast. Right, You're going to go from the south of the Dead Sea, to the north of the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, and then you're going to get to Damascus if you just keep following the Jordan River pretty far north, okay? So, um, so you got these three guys, and they're uh, at first going to humble themselves, and they're just there to comfort Job. They lift up their eyes, and they see how tore up their friend is. And they uh, lifted up their voice, they, they wept, they rent their clothes, they sprinkled dust on their head towards heaven. They sat down on the ground with him seven days and seven nights, saying not a word, for they saw his grief was great. Now, I want you to understand this mourning custom of putting dust on your heads, okay? There is a tie to this mourning custom to our proper attitude as Christians. Remember, we're supposed to be our flesh, is, we're supposed to look at our flesh as already dead, crucified with Christ and not give in to its desires, okay? We're supposed to be living led by the Spirit and basically crucify our flesh with Christ, treat it like it's dead, okay? This act of throwing dust on your head is an act of humility like that. It's basically saying we are but dust because they're acknowledging what God says to Adam when he, basically, Adam is condemned to die because of his taking of the tree of knowledge. He's going to say, you're going to uh, live and you're going to work hard and then you're going to die and return to the dust for, for from dust you're born and dust you remain. And what they're saying is it's basically like an appeal to God for mercy to say we are but dust. What can we do? We're, you know, we're no, we're all we are is dust. It's basically an acknowledgement of our weakness, our frailty and the fact that we're all doomed to die. Okay. 
And so when people die, people are going to go through this morning of basically it, it's it's remembering we are but dust and we're all doomed to die. Okay, it's not supposed to be happy. It's supposed to be an act of humility before God and a representation of what God has said. Okay, um, so you're going to find the righteous doing this. They're going to be putting, you know, not just when people die, but when, you know, the people are wicked around them or when they go through calamity, they're going to throw dust on their heads as a way of appealing to God. Okay, and you're going to do this. And for seven days, seven nights, just sit there and not say a word. That's interesting. I've never gone seven days without saying a word. So uh, that's interesting. Um, I'll, maybe I'll try to do that sometime. Um, and then, uh, after seven days of just sitting there saying nothing, Job opens his mouth and he cursed his day. He's not going to curse God. He's going to curse the day of his birth. And he says, let the day perish where I was born and the night in which it was said, there is a man child conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let God, uh, let not God regard it from above. Neither let the light shine, shine upon us. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let the cloud dwell on it. Let the blackness of day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined to the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Lo, let it, um, that night be solitary. Let no joyful uh, voice come therein. Let them curse the day um, who are ready to raise their morning. Raise up their morning. Let them curse the day who are ready to raise up their morning. So what he's saying is he wishes he was never born. And he's saying anybody who wants to more raise up their morning, um, that curse that day. In other words, anyone who wants to feel sorry for him or pity him, let them curse the day that he was born. Job is reaching the conclusion that he is cursed right away. And most of us would. All this crap happens, you're cursed. And his big question is, I'm obviously cursed by God. What did I do? I don't know what I did, but I'm cursed by God. I wish I was never born. He's already starting to feel like this is not fair. I don't understand. What did I do? I wish I was never born. So here's his starting point. Remember, he's been, kids have been dead. His wife has told him to curse God. He's not cursing God, but he's basically, he is suggesting that um, it wasn't fair that he was born to suffer like this. Okay. It says, let the stars in the twilight be dark. Let it look for the light, but have none. Let it see um, before the dawning of the day, because it shut up, because it it shut not up the the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow from my eyes. In other words, curse. He's cursing the day he was born because it didn't stop his mom from giving birth to him and and going through all the suffering. Why died I not from the, from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the be belly? In other words, why wasn't I a stillborn child? Why did the knees prevent me or why did the breast that I should suck for now should I have lain still and be quiet and should have slept and then I had been at rest with the kings and the councils of the earth which build desolate places for themselves or were the princes that had gold which filled their houses with silver or as the hidden untimely birth which I had not been as infants which never saw light there the wicked cease from troubling and there the weary rest so they look at Sheol as a place of rest okay you you stop suffering in earth it's kind of like you're in jail think about it like this if life is really hard a homeless person will get themselves thrown in jail just for a bed in the hot meals okay this literally happens i've been homeless before and i tell you the police will arrest you and they will try to keep you from sleeping in the jail because homeless people will try to get themselves arrested just to be able to lay down and go to sleep because there's nowhere you can lay down your head. They're going to they're gonna let you into these shelters if you make it in the right time. They're going to kick you out at like 6 in the morning. And you're just walking the streets and it can be cold, it can be hot, whatever it is. You have nowhere to rest. You have no job. You have no money to go sit in anywhere. And nobody wants you in there because you're a bum. They don't want you bumming money off people. Okay? And... Um, it's like that and homeless people will get themselves arrested just for just to rest okay well she owes a prison and that's how they look at death at least my suffering's over i don't know what's going to happen we're going to be resurrected in the last day and we're going to be judged but he wishes that he was just stillborn and went straight to sheol okay 
Um, remember, there's no place called Abraham's bosom in Sheol because Abraham is not widely known as you know the father of righteousness yet. Okay, and these aren't Hebrews. So he says, there the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice of their oppressor. The small and the great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Wherefore is light given to him in this misery, and life to the bitter in soul? Like, why is light given to him that is in misery, and life in the bitter and in soul? Like, Job is getting a taste of what it's like to be impoverished, sickly, and alone. And he's saying, why was I ever even born? Okay? It's not better to have loved and lost, to have never loved at all. It sucks. I want to die. I wish I was never born. Um, which long for death and it comes not, which dig for it more than for hid treasures, which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave. Um, why is it light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God has not hedged in? For my sighing comes before I eat and my roarings are poured out like waters. Now, if you've really striven to serve God with your life and you've gone through suffering and, and not to be like you're sinless, but whether it's your foolishness, it's your ignorance, it's just persecution, whatever it is, it does get to this place where you're just like, I just want to die. Especially when it's like lonely and you're trying to do the right thing and you keep finding yourself struggling with sin and you keep finding yourself being rejected whenever you're trying to pursue righteousness, you're alone, you're not finding fellowship in that. It does feel like I just want to get this over and die. And God has a bigger picture. He's going to keep refining you. He's going to use you. And if you understand that bigger picture needs to be focused on the more you suffer, the more God will use you for his glory. Okay. And yes, there are rewards involved with that. But the biggest one is love because that you suffering and going through that is to comfort other people who suffer and also your your right attitude in that suffering is meant to point people to Christ, which is going to be their salvation. Okay, so if you're suffering, if you're lonely, I would I would recommend this: find somewhere to serve. I don't care if it's a soup kitchen. I don't care if it's a church that the doctrine sucks. Find somewhere to serve. Get there and look for people who are suffering and try to be a benefit for them. Okay. If you suffer from lack of being able to pay your rent, well, then try to solve that problem first. And once you do that, take what's left with you, no matter how miserable you are, and find a church, find a ministry, find an outreach. There have been times where I just grab a bag of dollar cheeseburgers and go down and sit with the homeless and talk to them about Jesus. Yes, they're going to reject you too. They're going to persecute you too. But remember, you're doing this for God's glory. And you're doing this for the hope of their eternal life. So when you get to heaven, trust me, all those efforts are going to be accounted. Okay, you you are you are not going to be invisible in that. And the point is, is that you take your suffering and you you turn that into a realization that this life is short and full of suffering. The only help you have is God. The only hope you have is in the resurrection from dead when all the suffering is over. Okay. And you let that be your anthem and you put one foot in front of the other and serve someone else in your suffering with whatever you got. And if that's just praying with people, if that's just encouraging people, that's all you got. Okay? It doesn't have to be exorbitant. It doesn't have to be giving large amounts of money away. It doesn't have to you know, necessarily yield all kinds of stuff. Maybe it's getting on YouTube and just plugging a Bible study like I'm doing. Okay? Whatever it is, you take your suffering and you turn it into service to God's glory. Okay? Because... He is over your suffering, and he is not going to let that suffering be in vain if you turn the suffering to glorify God. And I know when you're in the midst of the suffering, it sucks to hear that. It doesn't feel right to hear glorify God when God is leaving you in a miserable state, okay? But don't ever assume that God is allowing you to suffer because he doesn't care or because he doesn't like you. That is never God. I don't care if you have sinned a lot. That is never God's intention. If he's causing you to suffer because of your foolishness, because of your sin, it's because he loves you. If he's causing you to suffer and you don't know if there is any sins that you need to repent of, it's because he loves you. He is trying to refine your person to make you more patient, more wise, more in touch with the sufferings of others. And he intends to use you. It's never in vain. Okay? And you, you want to just press into that. And you want to just sit silently before the Lord. This is where Job gets to at the end of this. It's just, I just want to be in the Lord's presence. 
and I just want to sit silently before the Lord until he comforts me. And I know when you're going through it, 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 it sucks. It feels like he doesn't care. It feels like he's mad at you. Um, you just want to just accept that and just go, I know it feels this way, but I know it's not this way. This is why the story of Job is there, okay? Because it's going to feel this way, and you're meant to feel that it feels this way, but it's not what it is. There's something else going on behind the scenes, and at the end of the day, God does love Job, okay? And he restores to him all this stuff, and he makes him an intercessor for his friends, okay? So... He says, for the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. Now, your charismatics are going to say, your word of faithers are going to say, he feared it. See, they're, they're looking for fault in Job. Okay, they, they ignore what God says, and they just use their own imagination to try to force their good God, bad devil into the equation. And so they're looking for a fault in Job. And it says, for the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I afraid of, I'm afraid of has come to me. I was not in safety. Neither had I rest, neither was I cry at, yet trouble came. Okay? In other words, he says, I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. Okay? There is nothing wrong with fearing the Lord. There is nothing wrong with having a lot of blessings and fearing that the Lord could take this all away. Part of Job's journey is growing to a point where God does take it all away, and it's still not the end. Okay? And it's, it's, it's like, I've been through this. So I've been through both homelessness and I've been through, you know, having a big pile of money. And I can say, having been through both of them, I'm glad that I was homeless. I don't want to be homeless again, but it could happen. And I know that. And I have to look back and go, I'm glad I was homeless. I'm glad I went through that rejection. I'm glad I went through all these people assuming you must be doing something wrong. So therefore, we're not going to help you. Okay? Because it taught me what God can do when you don't have the people you would normally rely on. It taught me what God can do when you don't have the job, the income, the intellect, the physical ability. I... I don't want to go, I don't want to make this about me. It's about Job. Job is far more righteous than me and he suffered far more than me, okay? But I went through the experience of scraping off infected skin and, and, and going through all this and like hurting and aching and stuff. And I still have aches in my body from that. And I can tell you that when God does this, he is preparing you for something. And I haven't seen it yet. Maybe this expanded, you know, YouTube ministry with now 500 subs plus is it. Maybe it's going to keep growing. Maybe this is all it is. But I know that I wouldn't be effective doing this if it wasn't for that. Because I know that um, you, you got to go through it. You've got to be humbled by it. And you have to get to a place where you're just, you just want to be used by God. I mean, that's really what the only good purpose in life is, is to be used by God, to glorify him, to lead others to eternal life, having a secure eternal life of your own. That's it. There's nothing else, okay? Everything in this world, the wealth, the accolades, the wives and kids, the houses, all of it, it all goes away. It all burns. It's not, nothing of this will you carry with you except for the people that you led to Christ, whether through evangelism or discipleship that's it that's what's going to go into the new heavens and the new earth everything else is going to be new god's going to divvy out portions and he's going some are going to have more than others to start out with but when we do it's not going to be about who's a who's better but it might be about who was wiser with what they did with what god gave them so if you if for instance if i lose everything in business and I spend the rest of my life striving to get back what I had, okay? Oh, I had a lakefront house, and now I'm renting a bedroom from somebody. And if I don't get back to having a lakefront house, if I don't get back to having a house that's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, I don't feel, like, worthwhile. And so I forego what God is doing and what God's trying to use me for to get back to that, you know, material wealth that I had. I could be wasting a lot of time that God has set aside for me to glorify him and to lead others to Christ or disciple people. And, um, and it goes away. Those rewards go away. Okay. I might still be saved, but my, my heart is set on the wrong thing. 
And so you want to let your suffering get you to a place where you realize it's not about how much money you have. It's about how much you're being used by God. Okay. And that includes, you know, if it's ministry, it's not about how many people are listening. It's not about it. it, it it's about the quality of what you're doing for, for the purpose of pleasing God. Okay. You let God decide how many people listen. You let God decide how many people know who you are. Okay, even if it's, you know, going through the suffering and stuff like it doesn't necessarily mean I need to have a big audience afterwards. All right, doesn't necessarily mean I need my my suffering to become a story in the Bible that everybody reads. Okay, there's a lot of people like me in the earth. There always have been. And there's people who suffered far more than me and have been used by God for them far more than me. And I'm not trying to be them. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be um, the best version of myself through surrender to what God's doing. That's it. And when I open my mouth, I'm trying to open up, up my mouth to glorify God or keep it shut. Okay? That's what I'm going for. That's what we need to be going for. And whatever we end up with in eternity, the more we do that, the more we're wise, like Job, in our suffering, the more God is going to be glorified through us and the more we're going to be rewarded. Okay? So it's not about what you got. It's about how you, you manage it, basically. So, so he's miserable. He wishes he was dead. And Eliphaz the Temite, Temanite, this is Esau's firstborn son, is going to be the first one who tries to comfort him. And he's going to start with things that he's experienced. And he's going to speculate a judgment on Job, okay? So notice he says, if we essay to commune with thee, in other words, if we attempt, naka, um, to test, attempt, um, so if we attempt to, com to, to, to speak with thee, will you be grieved? Um, but who can withhold himself from speaking? So in other words, if we, if we attempt to communicate with you, will you be grieved? He knows you're miserable. Okay. I want you to understand that Job's friends are not coming in this trying to judge Job. Okay. They feel sorry for their friend. They're good friends. They're weeping in the morning. They traveled from far away when they heard what happened. They're literally like Eliphaz is the leader of this. He gathered two of Job's friends. Remember, these would all be men of means. They're all wealthy. Um, and this is this is unusual what's happened with Job. And so they go there and they do a very noble, not judgy thing, which is just to sit there with a, their clothes torn and dust on their heads for a week and not saying a word. OK, so don't think of this as like these arrogant guys just showed up and just started judging him. These are people who are really trying to understand from their human reasoning without any divine revelation what happened to Job. And they're trying to make sense of it. And he's going to offer Job his best understanding. And he's going to try to encourage Job past his, I wish I was never born. And he's just going to screw up. And they're going to keep screwing up. And this is going to be a common thing. When you see somebody who's suffering and there's nothing you can do about it, you get frustrated. You get frustrated because they're miserable and there's not, nothing you can do about it. And you keep coming up with reasons, whether it's what they did or you know, what they should do. And the reality is, is you don't have an answer. You don't have one. And all you can do is just grieve with them and tell, you, tell them you love them and tell them, you know, God is good and God loves them too. And they're going to come out of it and um, just be there for them. Okay. Sometimes there isn't a solution. Sometimes you can't fix it. Sometimes there is no right answer that you can give them because you just don't have it. Unless you have it from God, you don't have it. Okay, And the comfort that they need only, only can come from God. But your friendship is just not rejecting them. It's not going away. It's not judging them. And it's not pretending to know what's going on. Okay, Job and his friends are going to learn that they don't have this. And I've been in this place with other people who are suffering. And I know other people have been in this place with my suffering. So don't be quick to judge these guys. Listen to what they're saying and listen to what their rationale is. Because they're thinking along the lines of things that are going to be common to what people thought in that era about God and about his ways, okay? And some of this stuff is going to come from um, special revelation, but it's not divine. He's actually going to have demonic influence in what he has, okay? So you want to understand these things because the reason these things go into the Psalms and the Proverbs, a lot of them, a lot of the things that Job's friends have is because they were common understanding about God, about angels, about good and evil and stuff like that in that day, which probably means the stuff goes back to Noah and maybe even older than that, okay? 
So he says, Behold, you have instructed many, and you have strengthened weak hands. Your words have upholden him that was following, and you have strengthened feeble knees. So he has been encouraging and helping other people for years, okay? But now it has become upon you, and you faint. It touches you, and you are troubled. In other words, you've encouraged other people when they've gone through similar suffering. Now it's come to you, and you're, you're troubled. Is this... Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, and thy uprightness of thy ways? So what is he saying? He's saying, is not this your fear, your confidence, your hope, and the uprightness of your ways? Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished while being innocent, and where were the righteous cut off? Okay? So he is going to take a proverbial statement about the normalness of, you know, the, the who, whoever perished being innocent and when were the righteous ever cut off. Now, one of the things I want you guys to see that it's normal to think of human beings in terms of innocent and righteous. Remember, they're not thinking in terms of flawless perfection, never having made a mistake or sin before. They're thinking in terms of the integrity of your heart, how you're walking, if you're living to please God or not, Okay. And he's saying, is this your fear? Is he, he's saying, not your is it, is it not your fear, your confidence, your hope, and your in the uprightness of your ways? So what is he what is he saying here? So here's the American standard: is he's saying, it's not your fear, your confidence, and the and the integrity of your ways, your hope. That sounds like a better one. Um, so he's basically saying, um, what he seems to say is that um, he, his confidence is in his fear of God and his integrity is, um, is his hope, okay? And so, so what he is basically saying is, in general, let me look at some other versions. So remember, he fears God and he walks in, inte in integrity. And so they know him to be a man who fears God and walks in integrity. And he's saying, it's not your fear of God, your confidence, and the uprightness of your ways, your hope. So therefore, what is he going to say? Um, remember, has anyone ever perished being innocent? And where were the righteous cut off? It must be your fault. Okay? If you hope in your fear of the Lord and you 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 you, you hope in your... Um, the integrity, your uprightness of ways, um, and your confidence is in your fear of the Lord, then you must have done something wrong, okay? Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow weak wickedness reap the same. And so what they're encouraging him to do, what Eliphaz is encouraging Job to do, is think about what you must have done wrong. Again, he thinks this is how it is. You must have done something wrong, right? I mean, you were walking in integrity and in the fear of the Lord, and you were blessed and wealthy, so now you're not blessed and wealthy, it seems. You must have done something wrong. It's logical, right? By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils they are consumed. The roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, and the teeth of the young lion are broken. The old lion perish for lack of prey, and the stout lion's whelps are scattered, scattered abroad. In other words, um, you could be like this great roaring lion, like a king, but if you tick off God... Um, he's going to destroy you and your kids are scattered abroad. He's, he's saying, this is what's going on with you, Job. Now, 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 now listen to this. This is what he's going to say. This is the source of his inspiration. Remember how Satan is Job's accuser, okay? He says, now a thing was secretly brought to me and my ear received a, a little thereof. In other words, um, I heard something. I heard a secret. In thoughts from visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on man. In other words, I was half asleep. I had a dream. I had a vision. Okay? Fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, and my the hair of my flesh stood up. Now, I can tell you this is not the Holy Spirit. How do I know? The Holy Spirit keeps us all alive. The Holy Spirit never makes us feel terror. It's just, that's not the Holy Spirit's purpose. When the day of the Lord comes and destruction comes from the Lord, what you're not going to be feeling is the Holy Spirit, okay? The ultimate day of the Lord's destruction comes from the Father, and then the, the, the day of the Lord in terms of the millennium comes from the Son, okay? The Holy Spirit never, and I want you to hear this, the Holy Spirit never pours out God's wrath. It's never the Holy Spirit doing it. It comes through the angels 
It might come through the Lord. It's going to come through the ultimate revelation of the Father as a consuming fire in the end. It, it does not come from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit only comes to comfort, help, guide, and wisdom. The Holy Spirit doesn't really rebuke people. It might lead prophets to rebuke people based on what the Holy Spirit is revealing. Okay, But the Holy Spirit is, is, is a gentle, gentle, wise helper, counselor, okay, comforter. Okay, this is not the Holy Spirit. This is the demon. And it says the spirit, it says, as it passed by before his face, he says, the hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before my eyes and there was silence. And I heard a voice saying, so this is a demon coming to him, giving him what he is using to accuse Job. Okay, shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants and his angels he charged with folly. Now, where do you have an example of God charging the angels with folly that's commonly known? And that is in the creation of the Nephilim. Okay, So in the story of the Nephilim, and this is in the book of Enoch, and apparently whether or not you behold the book of Enoch as a whole is true, I really don't. But the base substance for it, which was probably embellished after that, I do, which is that it was understood that the angels mated with the Nephilim and they created, or mated with women and created the Nephilim, and that those angels were cast and bound into prison. And, and Jude is going to talk about this, okay? Uh, it's going to be talked about in Jude and somewhat in Peter. It's going to be Second Peter, okay? Um, and so he, these angels were charged with folly, okay? And he says, how much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust. Okay, so he's not talking about um, he's not talking about your physical house. He's talking about your actual flesh. Okay, it's made of clay. So we're spirits that dwell in houses of clay. That's our flesh, whose foundation is in the dust, which is which are crushed before the moth. They are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. Does not their excellency, which is in them, go away? They die even without wisdom. So does this sound like encouragement? No, this is discouragement. This demon is telling him God doesn't care about you. If you tick off God, he's going to destroy you, but he doesn't really care about you. He's saying, listen, they perish forever without any regarding it. Okay? They die without wisdom. God doesn't care if you understand God doesn't care if you die. Okay, this is Satan. He accuses God. Uh, he accuses um, God to us, and he accuses us to God. Okay, this is that toxic boss. This is that toxic friend. This is that toxic family member who needs to make you. You hate everyone else, and everyone else hate you. They divide you. Okay. This is what Satan's doing. And what is he saying? He even charges his angels folly. He puts no trust in his servants. Why does he put no trust in his servants? He knows angels will do evil. This is why he keeps mysteries from angels. Okay? And so they're ticked because they want to know all God's secrets. Satan and his angels want to know all God's secrets. They don't like that God's keeping stuff from them, nor do they like that he's showing certain favor and grace and mercy towards man. They don't like it. Okay? They don't like that angels got judged for what they did by going and basically taking men's women without permission for, as their own wives, okay? So they're looking, they, the angels, remember, the angels are not all-knowing. They're not omniscient. They know what God shows them. That's why uh, it's going to say the angels long to look for um, the things that are being revealed through the apostles, okay? Okay. The angels don't know a lot of stuff about God's ways of doing things until he reveals it through the prophets and apostles to mankind, okay? Remember, it says God will do nothing on earth unless he reveals it to his prophets. In other words, everything that God is doing in his big reason why, in his big picture plan, is not being shown to the angels first and then given to man. It's being shown to man, and then and then the angels see it, Okay. Um, they don't like that man is seems to be closer to God in terms of intimacy while they have more power and beauty and all that stuff. They don't think this is fair. Okay, this is this is what's in the heart of the fallen angels. And so he's he's basically saying he puts no trust in his servants. In other words, he's not telling us this stuff. And he charges angels with folly. So 
if he treats the angels that way, how much more men, they perish without any regarding it, they die even without wisdom. Now, this is Satan or one of his angels either knowing this is wrong and saying it or actually believing this. And that's what they think of God. And they're trying to get men to think of God what they think of God, which is that God's not fair, God's not good, okay? So he is listening to one of Satan's angels. He is listening to a fallen spirit who is trying to convince him that God just doesn't care about men. So in other words, you can try to be uh, righteous, and you must be righteous or God's going to destroy you, but this is the God of work salvation. This is the old covenant God. You're never good enough. You're, you work, but you fail. Everybody fails because everybody fails in the old covenant. The only thing you can do with the old covenant is fail. Okay, But the old covenant wasn't given without promises and hope of a new covenant. It was given with that from the beginning. Okay, That's why Abraham's promises preceded the Mosaic covenant. And that's why after everybody fails in the Mosaic covenant, his promises are still viable by faith. Okay, that is the big picture thing, and that's what your messianics and Hebrew roots people don't get. That's what all your legalists from you know your Calvinists and Catholics and stuff who try to pull you back under things of the law, they don't get. The law was there to show you that you can never be good enough on your own by your own resources, and now God has changed the standard of what is good. He has eliminated a lot of these rules, and He just wants you to love people. He wants you to love God and love people. Okay. So now he says, call now, and if there will be any that will answer thee, to which of the saints will you turn? This is still this fallen angel speaking, okay? For wrath kills the foolish man's, and envy slaves the silly one. I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his habitation. I cursed his habitation. This is Satan talking. I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his habitation. His children are far from safety, and they are crushed in the gate, neither is there any to deliver them. Whose harvest the hungry eat, eat, eat up, and take it even out of the thorns, and the ro robber swallows up their substance. Although affliction comes not from forth of the dust, neither does trouble spring out of the ground, yet man is born to trouble as, spark, as the sparks fly upwards. Okay? So... He is literally taking what the accuser is saying. Remember, this is the starting point of Job's friends, okay? He is believing this, this spirit, which is Satan, and saying, this is what I think. Now he's saying, this is what I think. Although affliction comes not forth, and dust, neither does dust spring from the ground, yet man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upwards. In other words, it just sucks to be a human. He's saying, I would seek unto God, and to God I would commit my cause which does great things, unsearchable, marvelous things without number, who gives rain upon the earth and sends water in the field. So in other words, he's saying God, he's still upholding that God is good, but he's imbibing this lie about God and man and how like men were just born so they could suffer. When you're going through suffering, when you're frustrated with God, this is how it feels. And Satan's going to be right there with those false words. God just likes to watch you suffer. That's just his thing. Men were born for suffering. It's not your fault. It's just, that's just what God's like, and he doesn't care, okay? He is unfeeling, he's uncaring, he's unempathetic. Um, it says, he gives rain, he sits on high, those that are low to those that mourn are exalted to safety. He disappoints the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. He takes the wise in their own craftiness and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. They meet with darkness in the daytime. They grope in noonday as in the night. But he saves the poor from the sword, from their mouth, and from the hand of the mighty. So the poor has hope, and the iniquity and iniquity stopped her mouth. Um, behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, despise not the chastening of the Almighty. You see, much of what he's saying is true. But he's going to be mixing what comes from this false spirit with this true doctrine, and you're going to get human philosophy. You're going to get an idea about what's wrong with Job that is based on speculation. It's not based on revelation, okay? They don't know. Now, this is simple. They don't need divine revelation to know God has, Job has not sinned. They don't have any evidence of Job having sinned. What they're doing is they're taking the knowledge of what they know about God in general, and then he's mixing it with what this demon has told him about what uh, God feels about man, 
and he's drawing to a conclusion that Job must have done something wrong based on speculation, okay? Never do this. Never assume that somebody is suffering because they've done something wrong. Never. You want to ask. You want to ask them because I, I, don't, I don't want to pray for God to deliver you from your suffering if the suffering is caused by your foolishness and your stubbornness and your rebellion and your sin. Okay, I don't want to enter into that with you. And I don't want to enter and share in your judgment. That's why the Bible says, lay not hand suddenly on any man and share in his judgment. Okay, I'm not going to pray over you for deliverance from your own sin when you won't repent of the sin. Okay? So I got it, but I got to ask. I can't accuse you of a sin without knowing what you've actually done. Oh, oh, you mean you're living with that guy? You, you said you're a Christian though. Okay, well, you brought that on yourself. You need to repent of that. That's your starting point. I care about you, but that's your starting point. You need to turn from that sin, right? So you want to have a proper assessment, but it never starts with an assumption. And what he's doing is he's mixing satanic doctrine and biblical doctrine to come up with his own philosophy, okay? So he says, Behold, happy is a man whom God corrects, therefore despise not the chastening of the Almighty. True statement. For he makes sore, he binds up, he wounds, and his hands make whole. True statement. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, and seven shall evil not touch thee. These are all over the Proverbs, okay? In famine shall he redeem thee from death, in war from the power of the sword. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue, neither shalt thou be distrayed, afraid of destruction when it comes forth. At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh, neither shalt thou be afraid of the beast. For thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field have, shall be at peace at thee, and thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace. Thou shalt visit thy habitation, and shalt not sin. Thou shalt also know uh, that thy seed shall be great, and thine offspring as the grass of the earth. Thou shalt come in thy grave, full of age, like a shock when uh, corn cometh in its season. Lo, this we have searched it, so it is. Hear it and know that it is for thy good. Okay. He just said he just said a lot of true stuff, but based on an error. Okay. This spirit came by and told me it can come and curse people. Appeal to God. He's saying a lot of true things, and it's mostly true what he's saying but he is drawing the conclusion that Job must have sinned. And so what is Job saying? Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed, my calamity laid in the balances together, for now it would be heavier than the sand of the sea, therefore my words are swallowed up. For the arrows of the Almighty are in me, and the poison whereof drinketh, me to, drinketh up my spirit. The terrors of God set themselves in array against me. Does the wild ass bray when he has no grass? Or loath the axe over his father. Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Or is there taste in the white of the egg? What is he saying there? These, these are these are metaphors for saying, am I miserable for no reason? Okay. Uh, the things that my soul refused to touch are as my sorrowful meat. Oh, that I might have my request that God would grant me the thing that I long for. I just want to die. Okay. So he is telling, he's trying to tell him to embrace his suffering because God's chastening him. And he's just like, I just want to die, okay? Even that I sh it would please God to destroy me, that it would uh, let loose my hand and cut me off, then should I have comfort. Yea, I would harden myself in sorrow. Uh, let him not spare, for I have con uh, not concealed the words of the Holy One. What is my strength that I should hope? Now, notice he's saying, I, sh I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. In other words, if God had told me anything that I had done wrong, I would have said, here's what I did wrong. He's saying, I have, the, the Holy Spirit has not convicted me of having sinned. I don't know what I've done wrong, okay? He hasn't concealed anything. He is not denying any words of God. He's Remember, it says, when he's saying the words of the Holy One, you know God gave prophetic words before Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There were other prophets running around the earth, okay? Noah was one of them. Enoch was one of them, okay? There were probably more than that. And their truth, he is not denying scripture. He is not denying, um, you know, what uh, what God's revealed. Um, but he says, what is my strength that I should hope? And what is my end that I should prolong my life? My, is my strength as the strength of so stones or is my flesh as brass? Is it not um, my help within me and my wisdom quite driven from me? To him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friend, but he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. In other words, he's saying, you don't fear God to just show me pity. You're coming up here with your assumptions. And he's like, it could happen to you. So he's basically saying, how dare you come here and assume to know what's going on 
because he's saying pity should be showed from his friends, but he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. In other words, you don't fear God to assume to know what's wrong with me. And Job is right. Okay. My brethren have de dealt deceitfully as a brook, and as a stream of brooks they pass away, which are blackish by reason of the ice and wherein the snow is hid. Um, boy. He's comparing them, listen to this, he's comparing his friends to black ice. He's describing it, look at when the streams of the brook pass away, which are blackish by reason of the ice and wherein the, the snow is hit. This is what he's saying. He's saying his friends are like when you step on a stream when it's frozen and the snow's covering it and you don't realize and you slip and fall. He's comparing his friends to black ice, okay? Can't trust black ice, right? Um... <laughs> There's a key and peel skit about that. Anyways, um, what time they wax warm, they vanish when it is hot, they are consumed other place. Their paths are turned uh, other way are turned aside and they go to nothing and perish. Um, okay. The troops of Tima looked, and the companies of Sheba waited for them. Okay. Now notice he's mentioning these people, Tima and Sheba. Most of you might think this is boring to get into all these table of nations things, but this is what will get you good at understanding prophecy, okay? Tima is in Genesis 25 too. These are also descendants of Abraham, okay? Um, the other one he mentioned is... Sheba. And then you have... Oh, these, these are uh, Ishmaelite tribes, okay? So Tima, Tiba, Tima, and then Sheba is going to be um, Sheba is going to be Sheba and Dedan. These are also sons of Cush. Um, also, Abraham has a Sheba and Dedan. Also, uh, there's going to be a Sheba that's the son of Joktan, okay? So, it's one of those three. They would have all been born and probably had tribes by now. But the point is, is that Job is, men is referencing tribes that are around him, okay? The troops of Tima looked, which is it's a Cushite tribe. Um, the, the, the companies of Sheba waited for them. They were confounded because they had hoped. They came thither and were ashamed, okay? So apparently, I would guess these are both Cushite tribes because these are Nimrod's cousins. They're, they're attacking people in this time, okay? And so um, this would have been a common way that people, you know, are going, um, they, they get consumed uh, if they're under God's judgment, he's saying. In other words, these, these people would come attack them, Okay. He says, they are confounded because they had hoped they came thither. They were ashamed for now you are nothing. You see my casting down and are afraid. Did I say bring unto me? Now notice, notice what he's saying to them. He's saying, you see what happened to me and you're afraid because you don't understand why it happened. And so now you're coming up with your speculations about why it happened. And he's saying, listen, did I ask you for anything? Or did I say to give me of your substance? Otherwise, am I asking you for any of your money? Or deliver me from my enemy's hands. Is this your responsibility? Redeem me from the hand of the mighty. He's, in other words, did, am I asking you to solve my problem? This is what he's saying to Eliphaz, okay? He says, they don't know how to solve his problem. So what they do is they're trying to make it his fault, okay? He says, teach me and I'll hold my tongue. In other words, if you know what my sin is, go ahead and tell me what it is, okay? This is the kind of stuff people will do to you. They're going to, oh, you must have, you must have. And it's like, okay, well, what did I do? Well, you know, the Holy Spirit knows. No, I don't. Are you calling me a liar without evidence? Are you calling me a sinner without evidence? Okay. Do you want to tell me what my sin is? Fine. But don't just sit there and speculate that I must have done something wrong because I'm going through suffering. That's not true. Okay. And people still do this. It is rampant when you're among word of faith people. Okay. Teach me and I'll hold my tongue and cause me to understand wherein I, I have erred. How forcible are right words, but what does your arguing reprove? He's like, you just told me like basically about how people generally get judged and say, so assume you're wrong and suck it up. Okay. 
Do you imagine to reprove words and speeches of one that is desperate, which are as wind? In other words, your words are just meaningless. If it'd be one thing if you were just like, well, you cheated on your wife that one time, and you know, never really got you know a comeuppance for that. You you didn't give me anything. You just basically said, yeah, I heard from a demon, and God's generally like this, so assume you must have done something wrong. Okay. Yea, you overwhelm the fatherless, and you dig a pit for your friend. Now, therefore, be content. Look at me, for it is evident unto you if I lie. He's like, look me in the eyes. Do I look like I'm lying? Okay. Remember, he's a mess physically, but he's got his integrity. He would know if he's sinned and he's, he's getting a recompense, right? Return, I pray you, and let, not, and let it not be iniquity. Yea, return again. My righteousness is in it. Okay. Now, what does he mean? He's basically telling his friend to repent, okay? Repent of what you're thinking and don't don't think iniquity of me, okay? He's saying, be changed. You repent for my righteousness is in me, okay? I have not done any sin that I am aware of. Is there any evil in my tongue? Cannot my taste discern perverse things? It's like, you guys know me. I'm over 100 years old, okay? I, do you think I would be sinning and not know that I'm sinning? That's what he's saying, okay? So he's like, you got nothing. You're not helping me. You're not comforting me. You're just basically trying to get me to accuse myself, and I don't even know, okay? And he says, Is it not an appointed time to man on the earth, and not, are not his days like the days of a hireling? As a servant earnestly desires a shadow, and a hireling looks for the reward of his work, so am I made to possess months in vanity, and wearisome nights are appointed to me. When I lie down, I say... When I shall arise in the night, when shall I arise in the night be gone? I am full of tossings and turnings to and fro unto the dawning of the day. In other words, I don't get a good night's sleep. Have you ever had a really bad sunburn or really bad itch or something like that where it's like you just toss and turn and you can't possibly sleep, but you got to lay there because you're tired and you just lay there all night. My flesh is clothed with worms and clouds of the dust. My skin is broken and become lonesome. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eyes shall see no more see good. The eye of him, him that has seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. As the cloud is consumed and vanishes away, so he that goes down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. Therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain of the bitterness of my soul. Let me say I would rather be dead. You don't got any reason to say, I'm sinning. I Am I a sea or a whale that setteth the watch over the, me? When I say, my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaint, then you scares me, scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions, okay? Even when I try to just sleep to get away from my misery, I get demonic torments and stuff like that, okay? So that my soul choose, this, choose strangling and death rather than life. He's like, I'm miserable. God has given me over to Satan for destruction of my flesh. And I don't know why. Just let me complain and say I'd rather be dead. Okay? I loathe it. I would not li live always. Let me alone for my days are vanity. And I was, life, life sucks and it's short anyways. Just let me die. I just want to get to the end of this thing. What is man that you should magnify him, or that thou should set thine heart upon them, that thou should visit him every mor morning and try him every moment? How long will thou not depart from me, or let me alone till I swallow down my spittle? That's real, right there. I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee, O thou pervert preserver of men? Why hast thou set me? me as a mark against thee so that i am a burden to myself and why dost thou not pardon my transgression or take away my iniquity for now shall i sleep in the dust and thou shalt seek me in the morning but i shall not be in other words he's like i am willing to repent but what have i done what am i supposed to repent of right he's saying it as a question have i sinned like what have i done that i need to repent of So, Job is ticked. After seven days of sitting there, his friend has mixed an idea that came from a demon 
with general knowledge of God, general proverbial knowledge of God, and come to the conclusion you must have done something, so just accept the chastening of the Lord because it's for your good. Job's like, what have I done? What What is the point of anything you just said? You, do you think I don't know these proverbial statements? Do you think I don't know the word of the Lord? It's like, I know the Bible. What have I done? Okay? You're not helping me. So then he says, Bill Dad the Shuite. And again, this is probably one of like Abraham's grandkids or great grandkids. Okay? He's going to say, How long will you speak these things? How long will the words in your mouth be a strong wind? Okay, now I'm going to shut him down because he's getting uppity. He's getting uppity when we falsely accused him. And that's how we know he's not humble. I've actually had people do this to me. We're going to accuse you based on nothing. And if you, if you um, disagree with us in accusing you, we're going to use that as an accusation that you're just not humble. Okay? People will do things like this when they're deceived doctrinally themselves. Okay? They think, well, my life is pretty good. And literally, I'll know people who lie, cheat, and steal and practice false doctrine. And they don't seem to be having the kind of judgment and struggling that I'm having. And then those people, those very people are going to turn around and say it's all because of you and how wicked you are. Based on what? What's my actual sin? And they never have an answer. It's always just, well, and it's usually in the context of you pointing to somebody who's clearly sinning and showing them their sin. That they do stuff like this. Okay? So he says, how long will you uh, speak these things? And how long will the words of my mouth be a strong wind? Does God pervert judgment or does the Almighty pervert justice? If your children have sinned against them, he has cast them away for their transgression. If thou would seek God betimes and make thy supplication to the Almighty, if thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. Notice what he's saying. If you were upright, you'd be prosperous. Good God, bad devil. Okay? Though thy beginning was small, thy latter end shall greatly increase. Okay? The the ways of the righteous are up, 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 up. Glory, 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 glory. There's no shame. There's no sorrow. There's no repentance. The more righteous you are, the better it is. And under the law, that would be true. That's how the law was set up. That's how the old covenant was set up. Job is going through new covenant suffering. He's a foretype of the new covenant covenant because the new covenant is not led by Moses it's led by Christ and Christ was perfectly righteous and yet he suffered okay for inquire I pray of thee of the former age and prepare thyself to search of their fathers for we are but of yesterday and know nothing because our days are are upon earth upon earth are a shadow shall not they teach thee and tell thee and utter the words of thy heart can the rush grow up without mire can the flag grow without water Whilst it is yet in his, his greenness and not cut down, is it is wherewith before any other herb. So he's talking about the rush. So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish. Whose hope shall be cut off, and whose trust shall be a spider's web. He shall lean upon his house, but it shall not stand. He shall hold fast, but it shall not endure. He is green before the sun, and his branch shooteth it forth from his garden. So this is very similar what, to what James is going to say about the rich, okay? His roots are wrapped about the heap, and he seeks the place of stones. If he destroy him from his place, then it shall deny him, saying, I have not seen thee. Behold, this is the joy of his way, and out of earth shall others grow. Remember, James actually specifically references Job. So James is actually talking about how, like, the grass is just good. He's talking about the rushes, so he's talking about, like, reeds in a, in a swampy area. But um, how they're gone. If that water goes, they're gone, right? And he says, um, Behold, God will not pass, cast away a perfect man. Remember how God called Job perfect. Okay? God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help evildoers. Uh, he allowed Satan to attack Job, who he called perfect. Okay? Till he fill thy mouth with laughing and thy lips with rejoicing, they that hate thee shall be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. Okay? Again, he's, he's saying a lot of true things and a lot of encouraging things, but... He is saying he fundamental errors here because we know that God has said things that are opposite of this, okay? God has called him imperfect, and yeah, he's letting Satan try him, okay? So they think these things about God are absolute, and these things are generally true. If you are righteous, even if you go through trials, God's going to work it out in the end. You're not, your life is not going to be a calamitous story of somebody who just fails and fails and fails and fails and fails and fails and, fails and dies, Okay? 
It doesn't mean if you're righteous, you won't die. It doesn't mean if you're righteous, you won't get sick. It doesn't mean if you're righteous, you won't have car accidents and lose your leg. It doesn't mean things like that don't happen to the righteous. It just means, um, generally speaking, God is going to make it right in the end. Okay? That might be in the resurrection. But in general, back, back in these days, righteous people didn't really die that much. If people died, they were known to be wicked, generally. But you have Nimrod popping up, and he's oppressing people, and he's wicked, and he's winning for a while. And you have people who are suffering under him, and they're assuming, well, if they suffer by these raiding bands and stuff like this, they must be wicked. God must be judging them. Nimrod is the, the instrument of his righteousness. So then Job answers and says, I know it is so of a truth, but how can a man be just with God? In other words, he's saying, I know what you're saying is generally true, but how should man be just with God? And like, if God is looking for absolute perfection, nobody can, nobody can be good enough, okay? If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. In other words, if God were to contend with man, if God were to act as an accuser, okay? Now he knows, he understands what God is like. If God were to act as an accuser, like Satan is an accuser, he's like, you couldn't answer him one in a thousand times. In other words, he's never wrong, okay? He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and has prospered? which removes the mountains and they know not and overturns them in his anger, which shakes the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble, which commands the sun and it rises not, which seals up the stars, which alone spreads out the heavens and treads upon, treads upon the waves of the sea, which makes Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades in the chambers of the south. Okay, this is important. Um, Orion is, um, the Pleiades is going to be the seven sisters. Um, Orion is going to be um, Orion's belt. That's going to be um, kind of symbolized Nimrod at one point in time, and Arcturus is going to be uh, the big bear. Okay, so the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper are also bears. Okay, and he says in the chambers of the south, which does great things past finding out, yea, numbers without number, um, wonders without number. There's going to be another another prophecy that says he makes Arcturus lead her cubs. So he's talking about the way this. It's called the Maseroth, or it's called the. It's basically a. Um, their zodiac. Um, you do have people get into astrology at this time based around the zodiac, but the zodiac, the constellations are more like um, they they might have been used for storytelling back then, or they might have been used for just navigating because the this the sky is going to rotate as the year goes around, and so it's kind of a uh, looks at where you are in the night sky. And in the way that it rotates, the little bear follows the big bear. And so in, our, in Amos, it's going to talk about how he makes uh, Ar Arcturus or the bear lead her cubs. Okay. Um, so in other words, he's set the stars the way they are. He commands the sun and it rises not. He seals up the stars. So I don't know if God's done stuff like this before, like sun turning to darkness or the sun standing still in the sky like he does in Joshua. But he does say things like he commands the sun and it rises not. Maybe stuff like this has happened. Okay. Um, he which does great things past finding out and wonders without number. Lo, he goes by me and I see him not. He passes on also and I perceive him not. Behold, he takes away who can hinder him, who will say to him, what, what, you, what are you doing? Uh, if God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. How much less then shall I answer him? So the proud helpers, who are these? To surround, protect, or aid. Um, I don't know who these are. Maybe these are. Maybe he's the proud helpers are like seraphim or high-ranking angels. This says the helpers of Rahab. I don't know why he says Rahab because it just says oh Rahab helpers. Okay. The helpers of Rahab do stoop underneath him. So Rahab was apparently an epithet for Egypt back in the day. So maybe he's saying um, the angelic forces, because Egypt is now becoming the most powerful nation in the world. Okay, So maybe he's saying like the, the angelic 
forces, the angelic powers or the gods, if you will, that are helping Egypt become the most powerful country in the earth, even they stoop underneath him. Um, so again, Rahab can mean proud or strength, um, but it seems like he's saying the helper. If Rahab is an epithet for Egypt, he seems like he's saying the helpers of Egypt. So this would be during the time that Egypt is becoming the most powerful country in the earth, uh, while Nimrod's nation is dissipating. Um, I don't know if, uh, well, Nimrod's uh, nation is dissipating. They're building the Tower of Babel because it's dissipating. Um, I don't know if Egypt is becoming a superpower, but is it is becoming powerful because um, they have this consistent Nile and they're growing and growing and growing, okay? So apparently their, their nation is known as a great nation already. He says, how much less then shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him? In other words, if the angels that are helping Egypt stoop underneath God, how much less could I answer God? He's really saying, if God's looking for absolute per perfection, I'm toast. Okay, um, There's nothing I can do to contend with God. I'm never going to be right where he's wrong. Now, his attitude's going to shift as his friends keep accusing him. Okay, Not a lot, but it's going to shift a bit. And but before it gets bad... Um, God's going to put a stop to it, okay? Whom, though I were righteous, yet would not answer, but I would make supplication my judge. So I want you to see this. He's calling himself righteous, but he's also saying, I'm not perfect, okay? He's saying, but how should man be just with God? In other words, he's saying, how would man be right against God? Man's never going to be right where God's wrong, but he's still calling himself righteous because he still says, I obey God. I don't know what I've done wrong. I don't know how I've um, disobeyed God's words. I haven't concealed his words. You know, I've, I'm li living by his words. If I had called and he had not answered me, yet would I not believe that he had hearkened to my voice? He said, if I had called and he had answered me, yet would I not believe that he hearkened to my voice? For he breaks me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not suffer me to take my breath, but fills me with bitterness. In other words, if God's trying to reveal to him something, he he can't he can't think he's going through so much suffering. Okay. So if I speak of strength, lo, he is strong, or of judgment, who shall set me in a time to plead? In other words, he's saying I'm saying God's Almighty and God's all righteous. But if he's trying to convict me of anything. I'm going through so much suffering, I can't even begin to hear him, okay? If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse, okay? So he's not saying I am perfect. God's called him perfect, remember? Though I were perfect, yet I would not know my soul. I would despise my life, okay? He is, he is not claiming to be perfect. Now remember, perfect and righteous are two different things. Okay, perfect means you're holy, with without without blemish. Basically, it means you're you're not walking in any kind of sin. He's saying he's righteous because he's doing everything right as far as he knows. Okay, um, but he's he's not claiming to be perfect and never have sin. And he's going to mention you know the sins of his youth. Okay, he says this one thing. Therefore, I said he destroyed the perfect. This one thing. Therefore, I said. He destroyed the perfect and the wicked. If the scourge slays suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. Now he's starting to talk about God. Okay? This is not good. Um, this one thing, therefore, I said, he destroyed the perfect and the wicked. If the scourge slays suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? Okay? Now he's starting to think God doesn't care. Remember, this is what Satan's doing. He's, he's doing it with, with Eliphaz, which means he's probably doing the same thing to Job. Okay? He's saying he doesn't care that the innocent are suffering. The earth is given in the hand of the wicked. He covers the face of the judges thereof. In other words, the angels who are supposed to be like judging the wicked, they're not. Remember the days they live in. Nimrod is totally wicked and he's taken over the known world. Okay? The world is pretty bad. If not, where and who is he? Okay? 
Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away. They see no good. They are passed away as swift shifts and the eagle that hastes the prey. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave my heaviness and comfort myself. I am afraid for all my sorrows. I know that thou wilt not hold me innocent. If I be wicked, then why labor I in vain? Why am I trying so hard to be righteous if I'm just counted as wicked? It's not worth it. If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet shalt thou plunge me into the ditch and my own clothes abhor me. Okay, So this is a metaphor. If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands so clean. In other words, if I work so hard to purge myself of any sin or any, you know, try so hard to live a righteous life, yet he plunges me in the dip, dip, ditch, and my own clothes abhor me. He's saying, what is the point of trying to be righteous? For he is not man as I am that y'all should, you should answer him and we should, um, that we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any days man between us. Some, so your American, new American standard is going to um, call this like an umpire. But it's like a judge. There's no arbitrator between him and God that he might lay hand on us both. In other words, there's nobody I can appeal to if God is doing something wrong. He's all powerful. What do you do? Let him take his rod away from me. Let not his fear terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. Okay, in other words, what is the point of trying so hard to be righteous if he's just going to destroy you anyways and not care? This is how he's feeling, okay? Don't look at this as like he's rebelling against God. He doesn't understand what's going on. And he is succumbing to the idea that God just doesn't care. He's going to destroy the white righteous and the wicked. He lets the wicked prosper. David's going to say similar things in the Psalms. He's going to repent of it in the Psalms, just like Job is going to repent of it. But he's going through all this crap that most of us could not endure and he's getting to the point of saying, what is the point of trying to be so righteous? So then he's going to say, my soul is weary of life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say unto God, do not condemn me. Show me wherefore thou contendest with me. Um, is it good to thee that thou should oppress and you should oppress the work of your hands and should, should shine upon the counsel of the wicked? In other words, I'm trying to please you. I'm the work of your hands and the wicked are doing just fine. Nimrod's got a kingdom. The Egyptians are getting into idolatry. They're doing fine. And here's me trying to be righteous and I'm getting torn up in the desert. What the frick? Okay. Has thou, has thou eyes of flesh and seest thou as a man seeth? In other words, are you, are you limited in your ability to see what's going on here? He's, he's, he's calling on God to go, do you not see this? Do you not care? He's literally pleading with God to go, why are you letting the wicked prosper and look at me and I'm going through all this and I'm trying so hard to be righteous. What the frick? This is what he's saying, okay? Are the days as the days of are your days as the days of man, are your years as a, as a man's years, that thou inquirest after mine iniquity and searchest after my sin, thou knowest that I am not wicked, and there is none who can deliver me out of thine hand. So he's saying this to God, not to his friends, okay? He's saying, are you, are you just like a human who's just like, oh, sorry, I was over here. I didn't notice that you were suffering for your righteousness. Okay? This is what he's doing in his pleading with God. He's like, where are you? Why don't you care? Okay? He knows. He's like, there's nothing that you've told me that I'm doing wrong. So what the heck? Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet, though, yet thou dost destroy me. Remember, I beseech thee that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt you bring me to the dust again? In other words, you, you bothered to make me. I wish I was never born. Are you just making me to destroy me? Why? Why? What is the point of all this? Have you not poured me out as milk and curdled me like cheese? Have you not clothed me with skin and flesh and fenced me with bones and sinews? In other words, he's talking about how a baby is formed in the womb. So he, this knowledge is in the earth. You know, they've had probably miscarriages and stillborn babies and stuff like that. And they know um, basically the baby is like curdled milk and it's clothed with the skin and it forms and becomes its bones and sinews and stuff like this. Um, Thou has granted me life in, in favor and thy visitation has preserved my spirit. Um, and these things thou have hid in mine heart. I know that this is with thee. Okay. So no, in other words, he knows that God formed him in the womb. Okay. 
When you guys are pro-lifers and anti-abortioners, remember, those babies are being formed in the womb by God, okay? There are a lot of sperms who could pass by a lot of eggs that don't do nothing. It is a miracle when a child comes to be, okay? Every single time, it's a miracle, and God has a hand in that, okay? So he said, if I sin, then, then you mark me, and you will not acquit me from my iniquity. He, he's acknowledging, I know God is just, and if I sin, you're going to deal with it. He fears God, okay? If I'm wicked, woe unto me. If I'm righteous, yet still I won't lift up my head. In other words, if I act righteously, I'm not going to be proud and haughty against God. I am full of confusion. Therefore, see me in thy affliction. For it increases, you hunt me as a fierce lion, and again you show yourself marvelous upon me. You renew your witness against me and increase your indignation upon me. Charges of war are against me. Why then has you have you brought me forth out of the womb? Why have you brought me forth? If I'm trying to, if, if even when I'm righteous, I don't lift up my head. In other words, I don't get proud against God. And I know you'll punish me if I'm wicked. I fear you. And you still, you treat me, you, it says changes and war are against me. So um, I think changes would be like revolutions and war are against him. In other words, that's what it feels like. He's like being overthrown. Um, and he said, you renew your witness against me. You increase in indignation upon me. Why have I been brought forth out of the womb? Or, or what, why, I wish I had given up the ghost. I wish I had been stillborn and no eye had seen me. Okay. I should have been as though I had not been. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. I should have just been a stillborn. Are not my days few? Cease them and let me alone that I might take comfort a little. Before I go whence I shall... It says, before I go where I shall not return to the land of darkness and shadow of death, a land of darkness and darkness itself, and of the shadow of death without any order, where the light is as darkness. So he's saying, aren't my days short? Um, he's saying, stop judging me and let me alone that I can take a little comfort before I go to Sheol. It sounds like he's like he's saying Sheol, the darkness of the shadow of death. So Sheol is dark, a land of darkness and darkness itself, the shadow of death without any order where the light is as darkness. You say, okay, so before I go to this dark pit that is Sheol to rest in the dark, he says, let me have a little comfort. Now he's had a little comfort, but he's going through a lot of crap right now, okay? I'm going to stop right there. Job is going to be 42 chapters long, okay? Now, I know if you guys read Job and you study through it, it seems like a long book if you're a chapter a day kind of person, okay? Try to read more than a chapter. Try to sit there and read through half a Job at once or the whole thing at once. It's a long book, but there's a lot of meat on those bones. You want to understand that, it, that you want to really understand not just Job's perspective, but his friends as well. His friends are frustrated. They want to help, but they don't know how to help. And in their foolishness, they're offering what knowledge they have without really any real revelation from God about what's going on or without any real knowledge of Job's sin. Okay, This is what we want to avoid. And um, we want to keep our mouth shut. And Job's going through all this and he's pleading with God. And the only thing you can do with a person in a situation like this is pray with them, comfort them, confirm God's love for them, and then just wait with them for God to comfort them. Okay? Because eventually they're going to pass through it. Whether that's the death of a... Like, it doesn't necessarily mean their circumstances that cause their misery go away, but comfort will come. Okay? And it's gonna get better with time. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna stop there. Job's answered two of his friends. He's basically he's gonna have like two of his friends try to rebut him twice, and then one try to rebut him once, and then they're gonna be done. And then around chapter um, thirty two, I think, is when um, Elihu, the Buzite, the son of Barakel, of the kindred of Ram. So we're gonna try to we're gonna try to figure out who this guy is. He's this young kid who's there, and he lets all Job's old friends be there. And who knows? Is he a servant? Is he just a guy from town? We don't know, but he's overhearing all this, and he's going to speak up in the spirit of God. 
and it's going to be awesome. Okay. So we're going to have probably two more sessions. I'm going to try to do like 10, 10 per, and then we're going to go into Elihu and God's speech. Okay. Cause El El it's really interesting how it goes. It's like Elihu's talking and he doesn't really stop. It's like he talks and then all of a sudden God's talking. And that's what makes me wonder if like, okay, if Elihu is like full of the spirit of God and it's like God's talking or all of a sudden God shows up as Elihu's talking and cuts him off. It's not really clear, okay? Um, but Elihu is full of the spirit and he starts speaking to, to Job and then all of a sudden God shows up and shuts up Job. And he's going to say all kinds of stuff about creation, okay? And you're going to find stuff like this throughout. You're going to find all kinds of theology and what I would recommend that you do is be careful and be mindful of the sources of their doctrine. Remember, we know Eliphaz is getting something from a demon and he's getting something which it sounds like to be from traditional word of the Lord type stuff. Okay, so he's got two sources. His friends are going to be largely presuming things. Job is going to be appealing to ancient wisdom and things about God, but pay attention to what these non-Hebrew, or I'm sorry, non-Mosaic, they don't have any Mosaic law, they don't have any Sabbath keeping, they don't have anything but what would have probably been handed down to them from, you know, probably Adam. You have stuff that was traditionally handed down. Remember, Adam's, Adam's interface with God, Cain's interface with God, Enoch's interface with God. Noah's interface with God. So we don't want to assume that that the Bible is the exhaustive, like the, like the book of Genesis is the exhaustive of whatever de divine revelation God had given. It's telling the story it's telling, but it is not the exhaustion of what God has given. We know they've had other prophets. We've had other righteous men. We've had other men. Look, Job is going to meet God right here. Okay, so don't think that like all of divine revelation is cornered down to what you have written in the Bible and the, and the narrative there. Okay, there is other divine revelation, but it is going to be consistent with what you find in the Bible. Okay, and so um, we're going to get to this place where these guys are going to be drawing on that wisdom, but mixing it with presumption, mixing it with definitely demonic inspiration and coming up with more presumption about Job, okay? And that's why you want to you you want to take that whole framework, but don't just assume his his friends are just evil. They're ignorant and they're mixing things, okay? And you've got wicked things going on in the world. You do have Nimrod's great kingdom that is knocking out, you know, and raiding and um, subduing and pulling tribute from all these other kingdoms and stuff like this, okay? So the world that they're in doesn't really seem just right now, okay? Now remember, God is raising up Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and a nation through them that is, remember, he's already defeated Nimrod through Abraham's own hand. That's Amraphel, okay? And he's going to raise up Israel that is largely going to keep Assyria down. Well, I'm sorry, it's going to keep down um, Damascus, their uh, Amorites. Um, they're going to take over uh, Babylon, but they're going to take out the Amorites. They're going to take out the armies of Heth. And so the Hittites are going to fall, the, the Egyptians fall, and they, uh, the Israelites are really powerful until the Assyrians start to grow in the weakness of Israel after they divide, okay? So he, he does really raise up like a just powerful nation in Israel to keep kind of a, a peace and stability in the surrounding region, okay? Um, but right now, they're under Nimrod's tyranny. You got people raiding and pillaging. None of this is good. The world's getting wicked. People are falling into idolatry. And meanwhile, Job, who is known as one of the most righteous people around, is suffering really bad. He's of the original table of nations. He's the great grandson of Noah himself. He probably knew Noah. Maybe not. He he could be. This could be. This could be after Noah's died, actually, because if he's the youngest son of the youngest son, it could be after Noah's died. Um. But he's definitely probably known like Shem, because Shem would have lived to be like 500 years after the flood. Um, maybe, maybe he would have known Shem. Maybe. Maybe that would have been too late, too. Okay. Anyways, that's all I'm going to give you for right now. Um, we're going to try to get through this in four parts, and then we're going to go on to the Exodus, okay? I'm not, um, still working on my um, rightly dividing book, and... Um, the stuff that I am researching right now is very convoluted, so you're probably not going to have many crisp Christendom series. 
Um, so I'm probably going to mostly focus on this, but if I got something that's worth telling, I'll tell it. So hope you guys are blessed by this and have a good rest of your week. Batman out. Peace. Peace. I'm out. I'm Batman.